and welcome to Linguistics After Dark. I'm Eli. And I'm Sarah. If you've got a question about language and you want experts to answer it without having done any research whatsoever, we're your podcast. Settle in, grab a snack or a drink, and enjoy. So, long-time listeners, those of you who have listened to all three <laughs> episodes, uh, may note that it's just me and Sarah today. And that is because uh, Jenny has decided to take on more behind-the-scenes work, and so it's just going to be the two of us in front of the mics from now on. Yep. But don't worry, she's still around, and I'm sure we will still get contributions from her in uh, in post and as she listens to us record and tells us when we say silly things. I was going to do a uh, sometimes I can still hear her voice joke, but actually that's literally not going to be true for any of our listeners. <laughs> It's true. So we're going to try a new thing this episode, which is based on the fact that we don't do any research to answer the questions on the podcast. But we do do research when we go to put the show notes together. And by that, I mostly mean that Sarah and Jenny do research putting the show notes together because I edit and they do the show notes. Um, So we're going to talk about some of the things that we learned while doing the show notes from last episode. Yeah. So first of all, I'm only giving you the highlights. You should go read the whole show notes because they're awesome. Um, But a couple things. Number one, the thing I'm most upset about is that the study about German irregular verbs that I talked about last week, I can't find it. I have no idea where it went, but I can't find it. If you have any information about this, please tell me because I'm really upset. Um, I did learn a whole lot about what constitutes irregularity in German, and that's a whole other thing. Um, Also, the other consonants, the ones we couldn't figure out what they're called. They're called pulmonic consonants, which just means that they come from your lungs. Well, that makes sense. (laughs) Right? Like, in retrospect, should have figured that one out. (laughs) I mean, I do do figure, like, it would be weird for linguists to just have an unmarked category of consonants like obviously they had a name but i do like the fact that they're just like the other ones yeah i'm i'm good with that oh the other thing that i'm mad about was not something that i learned in the show notes but was something that i realized after the fact which is that because i have that aaron aaron mary 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 i said too many words merger um there's a church near somewhere that I used to live that's called All Souls Parish. and Wow, that's a hardcore church. <laughs> it really upset me the first time I said it out loud. Because like when I read it, I'm like, oh yeah, that's a different word. That's fine. And then I said it out loud and I was like, oh man, ow. Uh, do we know if Louisiana has this merger? Oh, that's a good point because they use parish instead of county. Or yeah, like exactly. Parish instead of county. Uh, I have no idea. Maybe that's something we can look up this week. I we should totally call this segment "Things Sarah Is Mad About" <laughs> once she did the show notes. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, should we learn a language thing? We should learn a language thing. Uh, today's language thing of the day is borrowing, and we're going to look at two specific kinds of borrowing. But borrowing in general is when one language takes a word or a phrase from another language. Um, There are two main ways that languages borrow. Uh, One is through loanwords, and the other is through calcs. Um, And as Sarah pointed out to me, the fun thing about this is that loanword is a calc, and calc is a loanword. I learned that from Twitter, so... That's not like a a novel discovery of my own. That's another thing I'm mad about, frankly. But also I love it. (laughs) Um, So a loanword is when a language takes a word from another language and basically just uses that word as is. Or sometimes um, because the phonologies aren't the same, they have to change some of the sounds in the word. But it's basically... This word is in a different language, and we're going to try to do that as um, as faithfully as possible. And a calc is when a language looks at a word that another language has and translates it part by part, or when we're talking about a phrase, word by word, into the language that is doing the borrowing. 
Um, and calcs are really cool because they like they're like stealth borrowing almost like they're legitimate borrowing, but it's like it's kind of sub Rosa. Um, nice borrowed phrase there. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we talked about loanword is a calc. It's a calc from German from the word Lenwert approximately, which is just German for loan and word. And calc is a loan word because it is a French word that means a copy of something. Nice. Yeah. Uh, so I have like a whole bunch of examples of loan words and calcs. Uh, but one of the ones that I really want to point out is whiskey. Because whiskey uh, is, depending on what language you're talking about, whiskey is either a loan word or a calc. Okay. Which is really cool. Whiskey has some like crazy etymology going on. So there's, <laughs> if we start with aqua vitae, is that? Yeah. My Latin is not. All right. There's a lot of Latin and a lot of French in this. And so, Sarah, just feel free to like smack me down. <laughs> if you want my one piece of advice, the AE says I. Ah. So aqua vitae. Got it. Aqua vitae um, is the water of life mm -hmm. in Latin. And uh, so it's been used through borrowing to refer to lots and lots of different alcoholic beverages. Um, it was borrowed into uh, various Scandinavian languages, and that is where Akavit comes from. Okay. Uh, and it was calced into French as eau de vie, and also into Irish as uh, Ishkibyaha, which okay. I'm not sure that that's close to correct, but... You tried. I did. We have IPA in the show notes and everything in the outline. Um, but that ishke is where we get whiskey from. Nice. So English borrowed whiskey out of Irish, which calced it out of Latin. That's absurd. Yeah. I love words. I know. Words are great, even if they're fake. So there are a whole bunch of like calcs and loan words and stuff. Um, some cool ones that I want to talk about. In English, uh, we have the word earworm which is like a song that you can't get out of your head. Um, and that is originally from German, from Ohrwurm, which is ear and worm. And then one that I didn't know was uh, Moment of Truth is a calc from Spanish. And it refers, uh, it comes from uh, Momento de la Verdad, which is the last thrust of a bullfight. Whoa, that's really interesting. Yeah, apparently it came into English through a Hemingway novel. That sounds right. So fighting um but english calcs are cool but i actually really appreciate the number of french calcs that are out there because french has this thing called l'academie francaise probably not saying that right no you're good am i oh cool um which is basically a governing body for the french language and is bad i love to rag on l'academie because it's so dumb and then occasionally I think about what it would be like if we had one of those for English. And it's just absolutely, like, incomprehensibly funny. Like, yeah. how could you... Like, they just dictate, like, the correct... Not just the correct way to spell everything, but the correct way to name different objects. And, like, can you imagine how much more boring this podcast would be if people all agreed on whether to call it a sofa or a couch? Or, like, whether to say marry or marry or marry. Like, our whole last episode just go out the window. Well, but that's the thing about... That's the reason that L'Academie is, like, not worth it. Is because, first of all, there are... Actually, I think there's one linguist in L'Academie oh, now. New. After, like, 200 years or something. Good job. Um, like, we're not even going to get into the fact that they call themselves immortals and they get to carry a sword. Wait, what? For some reason. Oh, do you? Yeah. So the members of the Academy are called the Immortals, and they get to carry a sword. And what universe are they from? Napoleon. Oh my god. Back when they thought that, like, okay, we're gonna, like, keep the French language pure, so we'll put a bunch of, like, playwrights and, like, natural history professors and stuff oh my god. into, yeah, and they were like, linguistics, what is that? That's not real. So, yeah, producer Jenny in the background points out that uh, playwrights are not really the people you want to keep your language stagnant and doing nothing. 
I don't know. Have you ever heard of Shakespeare? Yeah, I mean, this is the thing, is it's like they claim to issue all of these edicts, and then it's not even just, like, francophones overseas. Like, even French francophones are just like, yeah, okay, whatever, Academy, we're gonna continue. So they have this big thing where they they will calc words and phrases that the general populace is borrowing. Um, and like the big one there is uh, Le Weekend, <laughs> which the Academy hates. Uh, I'm not... Sarah, yeah, can yeah, you yeah. say the official... So the majority of French people um, say Le Weekend, uh, and like that is even what we are teaching our students in their French classes in high school. However, we are also teaching them that technically the official phrase is la fin de la semaine, the end of the week, which like fine. And I know Spanish uses fin de semana equally the same way, but the Spanish speaking people actually use fin de semana, whereas the French speaking people don't. And the Academy is like, no, on all of your official translations, like if you look at, um, I'm a dork. I have my phone set. My phone OS is set in French to help me practice. And whenever I set like an alarm to get me up on Saturday and Sunday, it'll be like le fin de la semaine, and I'm like, why? <laughs> it that doesn't even fit on the screen. Just say le weekend. It's fine. So this is a great example, though, of um, le fin de semaine, uh, or whatever that is pronounced correctly, um, is a calc. It takes the parts of the word and it translates them Mm -hmm. one by one into the target language. And le weekend is a loan word. It just takes the word wholesale from the source language and shoves it into the phonotactics of the target language. Yes. I also notice that you have courriel on this list, which um, is a shortening of courrier électronique which is electronic mail. So obviously, courier is email. Yeah, I love this. When they calced it, they calced, They took the shortening. Right, also. and I thought that was super clever. I learned the word courriel just from my phone, and I didn't take it apart. Mm-hmm. I didn't know the word courrier, like mail. I was just like, oh, courriel is what I get when I open up Gmail. Like, cool, I've learned this word. And I was talking to one of my friends who is a French teacher and like speaks fluently and has lived in France. And I said something about like, send me un courriel. And he was like, that <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no one <laughs> says that. And I was like, well, what am I supposed to say? He's like an email. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> but like now, because I've learned it from this L'Academie official source, like I'm always going to use that word and sound like a dork. It's going to be great. So all languages do borrowing, especially languages that have like lots of contact with other languages. Um, but occasionally you get people who are trying to parse out, uh, especially in English, you get people who are trying to parse out what the language would sound like if it hadn't, if the Norman conquest hadn't happened, or, you know, if uh, English hadn't been an imperial language, right? Um, and there is this cool thing that goes around every once in a while called Anglish. Yes. A-N-G-L-I-S-H. Uh, and the prototypical thing of this is um, it's like the beginning of a physics textbook, except all of the words that are derived from languages other than Anglo-Saxon or languages that descended from Proto-Germanic are replaced by equivalents or like potential equivalents. And I don't think that the people who put English out are like, this is how the language should be. I think they're very much like, this is cool and is a fun thing to do, which is like the right tack to take, because I'm sorry, like, this is what English is. It's it's all these things. So L'Academy is like the opposite of the English people. Um, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so l'academy is like the opposite, where they are saying we want to keep the language pure and we're going to try to do that through whatever small amount of Napoleonic power we have. Um, and then people like don't listen to them, but like the English people have the, the right idea where they're like, let's explore and have fun. Um, one of the cool things that comes out of that is they, so the word electron and electricity and so on, 
comes from a Greek word that refers to the material amber, because that's where static electricity sort of first oh, became yeah. known. Um, and so English uses amberic instead of electric. Um, I can't remember what word they use for the electron. It might be like an amberic moat or something. <laughs> um, but this like shows up in his dark materials where in his dark materials, they used the Germanic derived rather than the Greek derived. And in the world in his dark materials, they say amberic when they mean electric. And That's they call, where that comes from. Yeah. And there's one place it's very small, but they call amber electrum. Right. That's so, so fun. That's so fun. Yeah. Uh, hey, listeners, if you haven't read His Dark Materials, go read it. Or watch the HBO series. The HBO series is pretty good. Uh, so we talked about calcs a bunch in English, and I just want to talk about a few cool like English mm-hmm. words. There's that saying, right? Some languages borrow English, you know, hunts languages down in dark alleys, knocks them out, rifles through their pockets for loose vocabulary. Absolutely. Um, which I've I've always been like not a big fan of because actually like the Norman conquest was what shoved French into English and that's like where a lot of the there's like romance Anglo Saxon tension happening. But English does tend to absorb lots of words from different languages. It is true that English is an imperial language and a lingua franca, which lingua franca um is a Actually, I don't even know if lingua franca is a loan word. It might just be using Latin. But English has like a whole bunch of loan words all over the place. Some easy places to see them are foods, because you just call it the thing that it is in the culture that it came from, right? So like sushi or escargot or paneer. Or uh, in America, we say euros. And in the UK, they say donor kebab. Mm. Same thing. Euros comes from Greece. Donor kebab comes from Mm -hmm. Turkey. Um, There's also stuff that like got picked up thanks to World War II or the Korean War. Um, Skosh, meaning just a little bit, is from a Japanese word, skoshi, which means just a little bit. I didn't know that word in either language. Yeah, somebody will be like, yeah, just move that a skosh to the left. Um, Oh, is that like scooch? It has nothing. Actually, I don't know. I don't know if it has to do with scooch cool we'll look that up later yeah i don't hmm my intuition says no but i have been wrong before okay um or like honcho head honcho Mm -hmm. um there is japanese word honcho which is like the leader of a team or a group or a squad like a low level okay leader um and that's where head honcho comes from nice um but there's like all kinds of you know there's a lot of yiddish in english because of vaudeville and copywriters on TV, like saying something is kosher or saying that somebody has chutzpah or you had to schlep to the store or you're just going to have a little nosh. I was saying, I didn't realize nosh was Yiddish either. Nice. Oh, yeah. It's interesting who uses nosh as a verb and who uses it as a noun, because I have it as both. Yeah, I think I do too. Mostly as a verb, though. There are also a lot of religious terms that come from Hebrew. So, uh, amen. Or hallelujah. Um, Jubilee comes from the Hebrew word yovel, which means a ram's horn. Because you blew the shofar when it was the Jubilee year. Makes sense. Um, And then there's stuff that comes in from Spanish. And a lot of the things that come in from Spanish come from other languages. Um, Just like a lot of the stuff that comes in from French is ultimately from Latin. Mm -hmm. So like avocado comes to us from Spanish, where it was... Abogado, which meant lawyer, but that's because that's the closest word that they had to the Nahuatl word ahuacatl, mm. which was the name for the fruit and also the word for testicle. Great. Use your imagination. Um, and adobe, which was borrowed from Arabic, uh, altub, which means brick. Nice. So you got like multiple chains of borrowing happening here. So I have a fun story about the Spanish word for avocado. Oh, please. Uh, so there is the, the word lawyer. Uh, avocado but there's also um and i don't know actually like exactly the order in which these things happened but there's also the word aguacat um oh yeah which is used for avocado to distinguish it from the advocate or the lawyer Mm -hmm. and uh someone told me a story or i read about it online i don't remember um 
about a little kid who had been eating avocado and knew the word aguacat and really loved it and then um, bit into a jalapeno, which was a similar color or texture or something. And the kid obviously like spat it out or whatever and then said, uh, this is the fuego cut <laughs> taking the aqua from or the agua from aquacat, which is water and replacing it with fuego, which is fire because it's like an avocado, but spicy. Ah, uh, I love that. That's cute. It's so cute. And I love when kids, like, I think we talked last week about how there's a certain point at which kids can start to analyze and break down the parts of words. Mm-hmm. And so it's, like, adorable, but it's also like, hey, you're really smart, actually. You can put, like, water and fire as opposites, and you can be like, this thing has water in the name, and this thing is like it, but it's hot. So it's a fire thing. That's so cool. Brains are so cool. Brains are super cool. Um, yeah, we should do a thing on language play at some point. Yes. Send us your language play questions. Um, I know someone sent in a question about like spoonerisms when you flip sounds that we haven't gotten to yet. Um, send us more things like that. Maybe we'll do a thematic episode one day. Yeah, we could do like spoonerisms, pig Latin, that kind of thing. Yeah. On the topic of real language questions sent in by you our real listeners send us things if you want to send us a question you can email it to questions at linguistics either in text or as an audio recording um, especially if you are asking about phonology and accent questions uh, we would love to hear your voice and how you pronounce things um, or you can hit us up on twitter or instagram or facebook or slack um Anywhere you can find us on the internet, we will get your questions. Everyone should send us recordings of themselves saying, Aaron, Aaron, Mary, Mary, and Mary. Also, perish, perish, and perish like the guy from the Raven Boys, if you want. Yeah, yeah. Let's just get all of those recordings. It'll be great. And we'll do something with them, probably. I don't know. Uh, We'll listen to them and we'll be excited. (laughs) Okay. Okay for they asks via Twitter. I was listening to a podcast about the Irish language, and it mentioned helping vowels. Are there any other languages that do this? It seems pretty useful. Um, cool. That's a great question. Thanks for asking it. Eli, do you know anything about this? Because I don't. (laughs) Uh, I can save this from being a uh, a rule three question. Thank you. Go. Tell Uh, me things. I want to learn. Well, I will tell you that I'm drinking a Hopewell Goes called Table Salt, and it's really good. It's called table salt? Yeah, well, goes is like, it's like a style of beer that's like, goes well with salt. So okay. I think there's a little bit of salt in here. The concept of putting salt in your beverage seems really counterintuitive. However, I am drinking perfectly plum summer seltzer, and seltzer originally was named that because it had salt in it. So, yeah, awkward. This doesn't. It fre- frequently no longer has salt in it. But that's where the word seltzer comes from. You could probably add just a little bit of salt. It would amp up the flavor. Yeah, that's fair. But this is not cooking after dark. This is (laughs) linguistics after dark. (laughs) All right. So let's talk about helping vowels. Um, I only know this because I went to Ireland last year. And so I did a lot of looking up stuff about Irish beforehand because of who I am as a linguist. Um, Irish has this thing where... I'm going to get the phonotactics a little bit wrong, but basically um, they don't do consonant clusters or in a lot of scenarios, they don't do consonant clusters. Okay. And so in places where you would have a consonant cluster, um, there's an epithetic schwa. Ah. Um, For people who don't know what that means, it just means that there's a schwa that gets inserted when you say the word. Cool. So you get this schwa that gets inserted between two consonants so that they're not a cluster. And that's it's just part of the rules of the language, of the way that people say things. Oh. Um, and I think it probably sometimes is sort of just interpreted as, like, accent. But it, it is an actual part of the rules of the language. Sure. Oh, that, yeah. All right. So I just didn't know what the word helping vowels meant. Because... Japanese does that when they borrow English words, right? Yeah, although Japanese is a little bit different because it has sort of a really strict moraic, like consonant vowel um, thing. And Irish 
does do constant vowel consonant syllables, or Japanese will also do it at the end of a word. So well, the right. circumstances are different, but yeah, it, totally. You're absolutely right. I've been playing this game um, called Zen Koi that Jenny introduced me to, actually. Uh, and it's a Japanese game where you feed fish on your phone and then they turn into dragons. It's very fun. Sounds um, very Japanese. Yeah. Uh, it's very relaxing, hence the name Zen Koi, obviously. But all of the breeds of fish are Japanese names. And it's really fun when I find the ones that are obviously... Uh, oh, I'm going to get this backward. Is it a calc or a loan word? Calc. Uh, Lo- loan word. Loan word. Whatever. Borrowings from English. Uh, or just transliterations, almost, of English words. Um like there was one that had polka dots on it and it was called supato. Oh yeah. And you say it and you're like, oh, spot. But yep. you put in the su because you can't say S and P back to back and then you have the extra O on the end because you can't end it with a T. Supoto. Yeah, this this shows up a lot when because English has a bunch of especially S, um, S and then a stop and then R, right? Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of those clusters. And so when that gets borrowed into Japanese. Um, I think my favorite one that I learned in first year Japanese was Makudonado. So that's McDonald's. Oh my gosh. And you just like, it's, it's just everywhere. Oh yeah, that's true. Because like English, you can start words like SPR. You could be like spring. Uh-huh. And if you wanted to say that in Japanese, you'd be like supuring. Yeah. I mean, a lot of Japanese speakers also speak English. And so... Yeah. The way that I was taught anyway is that those vowels get quote unquote swallowed. Mm-hmm. And so you really like, you like, they're there, but you just try to go as quickly as you can past them on the sidewalk and don't look at them. <laughs> um, I think this is also kind of related to syllabic L and syllabic N and syllabic R, mm-hmm. those kinds of things. Do you want to explain what those are? Yeah. So, We were actually just talking about how in English we are allowed to have syllables that start with three consonants in a row, depending on what consonants they are, and that's fine. And Japanese is like, nope, you get one consonant, parentheses, numeral one, that's all. And English is lax enough about its consonants that we don't even, we don't even require a vowel to be in the syllable at all. So we can have a word like button and... The first syllable, obviously, is b, which is a b and an a. Uh. So you have a, a consonant, you have a vowel. If you want to put the t at the end of but and make that the end of your syllable, great. Then you have n, which most of us would just say is n. Like, there's not an actual vowel in there. It's just n. Yeah, but you just kind of you say but and then n, button. Right. Um, and so... That's something that uh, phonologists or phoneticians, whatever, people who study sounds um, call a syllabic N because it's an N that is being a syllable all by itself with no vowel. And vowels are typically the core of syllables cross-linguistically. And English also does this with L and with R. So you can have button, you can have butter, and that er is basically just an American English R by itself. In most British dialects, well, I shouldn't say most, I haven't surveyed them, but in many British dialects, they just drop that R off entirely and replace it with a vowel. So you could say butta. Yeah, because they're like non-rhotic, right? Right. So if they drop their R's, or like New England, a lot of accents in New England drop their R's. So you'd say butta, and you're replacing the R with a vowel. But if you keep the R, chances are you don't put a vowel in there. You're just saying R. And then you can also have bottle and or rebuttal, I guess. I'm trying to find really close pairs here. It's the the, the verb for what a butler does. He buttles. Yes, he buttles. And and when you buttle, you have butt, just like in butter and button. But then you just have ul, l, bull, buttle. So this is like, this is the thing where... I think a lot of people think that this is schwa L or schwa R yep. or schwa N, um, but it's phonetically different, right? Uh, 
Kind of. I feel like that's one of those things that the answer you get is going to depend on who you ask and what day of the week it is. Um, There's different conventions for how to notate those sounds. So some people will do a schwa and then the letter. Some people will just do the letter and put a little um, hash mark underneath it, which is the IPA diacritic symbol for is syllabic, even though it's a consonant. Um, And especially with R, um, there's also a special little symbol that means schwa, but like an R. Schwa, Um, but make it R. Yes, exactly. Uh, The fancy name is the rotisized schwa, which just means schwa, but make it R. And so depending on who you talk to, some people will transcribe butter as ending with the R sound syllabic. Some people will transcribe it as schwa R, and some people will transcribe it as this schwa with a little curly tail that means R colored or rotisized. I actually, so I fall into that last category. Yeah. Um, Although I can swear that I have used a syllabic R notation in other places, but I spent a lot of time in undergrad just going back and forth between the schwa and the rotisized schwa, trying to, like, figure out what the difference was physically Mm -hmm. and also probably scaring other people away. (laughs) Yeah. If you have spent time saying the schwa and the rotisized schwa to yourself quietly, trying to figure out the difference, and you don't know what your major is in college, your major is linguistics. If you've spent time just repeating two words in alternating pairs trying to figure out what the difference is. Your major is linguistics. Go sign up. Cool. So I don't know specifically if the Irish helping vowels are a manifestation of syllabic consonants. Um, So the thing about Irish is that it is a language that has a lot of its own linguistic terminology. So it talks about um, broad vowels and thin vowels or broad vowels and slim vowels and broad and slim consonants and there's like there's a lot of linguistics that was done on irish by irish people before linguistics sort of had like a global organization happening to it um and so there are a lot of names for things that happen in irish that are not necessarily sort of what what a academically trained linguist would call them so it's kind of hard to say about like does it fit in this category or does it fit in a different category i'm just thinking now about the irish linguists in the past being like the common french people and then academic linguists being like l'academy except the academic linguists aren't jerks about it and the irish people are like hmm you say epithetic schwa that's nice we say say helping helping well (laughs) right and just like (laughs) if you want to to study Irish, you just got to learn their own terminology because they're like, yes, we understand that you have words for this. We do too. Okay, bye. <laughs> yep. Um, That's great. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> do we get swords as <laughs> academic linguists? That sounds really dangerous. I'm not sure I would trust my academic linguist friends with swords. Uh, that's true. Uh, all right. Shall we move on to the next question? Yes. Actually... Our next question is going to kind of continue on this theme. Caitlin G. asks via email, how do linguistic rules emerge? For instance, in my intro linguistics class, we're currently talking about phonotactics and how a lot of languages have specific rules as to what sounds can go where in a syllable. How do those rules develop and why do different languages have stronger or weaker rules? The last sentence of that question is a Mm. really interesting thing to say about stronger rules and weaker rules. Mm Mm-hmm. Because I personally don't think about rules as being strong or weak. Um, There are rules, the way that I was taught, you know, there are rules that can counteract or prevent other rules. Um, But stronger or weaker rules to me seems more like an optimality thing, like an optimality theory thing, um, where things can have a certain number of strikes or they are ordered in a certain way. Mm. Um, so I'm not quite sure which thing was meant by Caitlin here. Um, but 
I think there is a lot of really interesting stuff to talk about, about how certain kinds of phototactics evolve and the historical implications, the historical linguistics implications of them. Yeah. How do these rules develop? Um, I, over time? I mean. <laughs> That's th- cheating, but it's also true. <laughs> like, there are a lot of different ways, and some of the sort of more, uh, some of the more famous stories are things like a king had a lisp, and that's why uh, Castilian Spanish has a th instead of an s sound. Wait, is that really true? I don't know if it's really true, but but it that's is a story. Th- that's the story. Huh. Um, cool. But there's also, I mean, the straightforward and also unsatisfying answer to this is somebody started talking that way, and other people also started talking that way. Mm-hmm. You know, you get sound changes that happen over a period of time within a group that is basically only talking with itself or is being influenced by a group that they're newly in contact with. But it's tough to say what the motivation behind those things is. The other thing that I was just thinking of is every language has to make decisions about the things in it that it cares about. Yeah. Which we talk about languages, like as linguists, we talk about languages as if they are sentient and conscious a lot, uh, which they're not. Um, languages are the way that they are because humans are the way that they are. And every time I have a student complain about languages being complicated or something just doesn't make sense, I'm like, hi, have you ever met a human? That's yeah. how we do things. Um yeah. Not to like take you off track, but I think it's kind of important to keep in the back of your mind for this question for folks who are listening that like language is an organic evolved thing. And just as there are evolved structures on the body that don't make sense anymore or are byproducts of other kinds of things, like keep that in mind that language is a human thing. It's not a mathematical or like a platonic concept. Right. I also I'm just going to keep thinking about L'Academie all day now but i just had this image of if language is an organic thing that grows and develops over time it's like a tree or a animal or something and i just had this image of l'académie d'arbre the academy of trees and <laughs> someone just showing up to the tree in your front yard and being like no that's not what leaves look like Oh man, l'Académie is the HOA of francophones. <laughs> yes, the the homeowners association, the the tongue owners association. No, no, <laughs> nope, we're done. Nope. Okay, anyway, um, but yeah, so like languages evolve and grow like a tree does, and like animals do, and like humans do, and sometimes, like Eli said, the reason that something happens is because someone did it and then kept doing it and other people imitated them for whatever reason, whether because they're the king and you want to respect the king or because you're like that seventh grader who sees that their friend has changed their handwriting and is now dotting all their eyes with circles instead of dots. And that's really cool. So I'm going to dot my eyes with circles or I'm just going to not dot my eyes at all and look really hipster or like whatever. People talk and imitate each other's speech in the same way. But also, when we think about the way that humans learn languages and develop languages, right? Because, like, there's a direction or a understanding by which, you know, English or French or whatever language exists in the world right now. And if you take an infant who was born five seconds ago, they can acquire that language and they can learn that language. Um, so part of this is about how a newborn brain can take a language and understand it. But in a kind of reciprocal way, languages have evolved over time to be understandable by infants and to be learnable by infants. Because if infants can't learn a thing eventually as they grow, then it's not going to survive because that's how humans are. So anyway, uh, languages have to make all these decisions about how they're going to present information. And we have obviously this huge range of sounds that the human mouth can make, but not every language has every sound in it. 
every language has had to choose which sounds they care about. And some languages, English has so many sounds. And that's what makes English hard for speakers of some other languages, because if you come from a language that has very few sounds, and suddenly you're having to differentiate all these different English sounds, you're like, what's even happening? On the other hand, because English has so many sounds, it can cram a bunch of them together, and it has more options for making like individual syllables different from each other. Oh, that's a good point, that the... The phonotactics help determine what the minimal pairs in a language are. Um, right. That the more sounds that you have, the more options you have for making minimal pairs. And um, I bet that there is some research out there at some point about sound inventory versus word length or um, yes. morphological type typology. Yes. I think I was actually reading a book about this that I haven't finished yet, but um, book rec, actually. It's called Native Listening, and it's a very um, academically inclined book, but I found it really accessible despite, like, I'm a linguist, but I'm no PhD, so I still found it really accessible. Um, And it's about how the languages that you know or learn as a child influence the way that you hear other languages, not just like, oh, I don't recognize those words, but like, not just the sounds, but also the prosody, like the rhythmic patterns and the tonal patterns in your sentences and what different languages use of those. Yeah, you see this sometimes when people are learning languages that have similar sound inventories, but very different prosody. Yeah. Like um, Spanish and Japanese is a good comparison because they actually have very similar phonetic inventories, mm-hmm. but the stress patterns are all different. And especially in America, people are much more used to a Spanish stress pattern. Mm -hmm. And so you get a lot of Americans who speak Japanese, but the words have Spanish stress patterns. That's so interesting. Um, The other thing, because I'm thinking about it, uh, the one study that I remember from the part of that book that I've already read was about Spanish, I think, and Dutch and English, and how Dutch has, and I'm going to have to go look this all up later because I don't fully remember, but if I recall correctly, Dutch has a very static stress pattern within words, so it's not variable. Mm -hmm. Spanish and English both have somewhat variable stress patterns. And that means that English and Spanish speakers, when learning each other's languages, are already clued in to listen for that change in stress, and it might indicate a change in meaning. Like, oh, um, interesting. Uh, like rebel versus rebel. Whereas Dutch speakers who don't have that sort of alternating stress pattern don't pick up on it in English or Spanish nearly as quickly, if at all, when they're first encountering it. And they did part of the study was they did a thing where the people would listen to a word or part of a word and then and they'd be looking at like an array of pictures And they did an eye tracking thing. So they saw where your eyes went to first when you heard the part of the word. And they used, uh, for example, um, October and octopus, which have the same first two syllables. And importantly, the same first syllable with the same vowel. There's no vowel reduction. Like octopus sometimes gets reduced to a schwa in the middle. But October, the emphasis is on the toe. An octopus, it's on the oc. And Mm -hmm. if you just say oct or oct, English speakers were much faster to pick the right picture. Oh, that's cool. An octopus or a calendar. And Dutch speakers who spoke English were 50-50 or something like that. Anyway, the point I was trying to make is that different languages are going to have different constraints on what their syllables can be based on what other constraints have developed in the language. You can't have all of the different things. Yeah, you have to pick and choose a little bit about where you're going to have a lot more of something and where you're going to kind of have some have some ambiguity. Yeah, because humans can handle ambiguity very well. They can't handle it indefinitely. They also can't handle absolute non-ambiguity because... That's just too much information to keep track of. 
And as my sign language teacher was fond of saying, humans are lazy. It, that was her reasoning every time someone was like, well, how come this sign used to be X and has now like evolved into this like more streamlined version that's much less clear? And she was like, because we're lazy and no one wants to like make five gestures when you can make one that clearly so says the same thing. That reminds me, actually, uh, I was going to talk about this, but that's a really good segue into one of the most common historical sound changes, which is lenition or softening. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. um, there's a chart, we'll find it, and we'll put it in the show notes, of a bunch of different phonemes and sort of what direction they tend to go. And you can see that um, sounds tend to soften over time in terms of historical change. And it doesn't always happen. There are all kinds of other changes. But um, my guess is that that sign language process is similar oh, to absolutely. lenition. And this is one of the sort of pet peeve things, which is like, it's not, it is speakers being lazy, but it's not people being lazy. It's the vocal apparatus being right. lazy. And that's right? actually what I was going to say is she would joke and it would be like, because we're lazy, but it wasn't in like a, ugh, humans are so lazy. Why don't we say it the right way anymore? Kind of way. It was a, humans are lazy. Humans are economical. Yes. Like, don't... Economical is, is a much better way to put that. Right. Like, your brain has so much information to process all the time. And so when it comes to the possibilities of language, this is why infants have the capability to distinguish between every single possible sound and every single possible, like, syntax thing and every single possible everything. And they learn pretty quickly, like within a year, which sounds, which sound patterns matter, and they get rid of the rest of them. And they will learn this even if you did not intend them to learn this. And that's where Creole languages come from. Mm -hmm. If you have two cultures that meet and they trade and they interact and um, eventually, you know, they're going to shack up together um, in the immortal words of my morphology professor, Rand Valentine, um, you sell enough fish together, eventually you're going to have a kid. <laughs> Amazing. And if your two parents don't, you know, their native languages are not the same, or, you know, they are using some kind of uh, pigeon to communicate, uh, the next generation of the community that's using that pidgin will interpret that pidgin into what's called a Creole language, which is the infant linguistic apparatus taking in the input that it has and making a language out of it. Mm -hmm. um, also, just to clarify, we mean pidgin, P-I-D-G-I-N, which is like contact language, not like a bird. Yeah, that's a it's a it's a technical term for a not quite language that occurs when two groups of people that don't speak the same language need to develop a communication strategy. Yep. And then, as Eli said, if that pigeon sticks around long enough for kids to start learning it, it will become a creole, which is just a pigeon, but codified and growing into a real language of its own. Yeah. I mean, pigeons don't have syntax. They don't really have like phonotactics. They don't really have structure. But a yeah. creole is what happens when you filter that through a newly minted linguistic apparatus, such as comes standard with just about every infant. Yep. Um, so infants learn this stuff and they figure out what matters and what doesn't. And then they're like, you know, I got to learn other stuff. I got to learn how to walk. I got to learn how to eat. I got to learn how to like deal with these new appendages that I have because I keep growing and that's really weird. And... Right, I can hear all these sounds, but like now I have to say them back if I want people to pay attention to me. And forget that I have sounds, but like how do I combine them into things that mean things? I, the, there's so much stuff I have to learn. And so they dump overboard all the extra possibilities for a language in order to take in and make space for all the rest of the things they have to do with their life. And different languages keep different things and dump different things. So I guess kind of what we're saying is phonotactics are a way to build in some redundancy to make up for that lost um, variation. 
right? That if you have those rules, then if you miss some information coming in, you can unconsciously reconstruct it because you know the rules that the language has to adhere to, which you've developed by learning that language. Yes. Um, And that redundancy is really important too. I was, again, as I frequently do, listening to a recent Lingthusiasm episode. They were talking about how children and adults learn languages really differently. And it's not just because of like that magical window when you can hear all the sounds and all that stuff, but because adults... Adults have already filtered out a lot of this stuff, and so when you have extra rules like gender agreement or number agreement between nouns and adjectives, or like why do my verbs have to have an S on the end if it's a singular person doing something instead of multiple people doing something, and adults learning new languages find those types of constraints really confusing because it's very easy to mess them up, but children love those kind of constraints because that means if I didn't hear the subject of the sentence but I hear you say walks I know it's only one person so I can like look at the context around me and be like oh you must mean dad because he is the one over there or things like that so that's another part of it so the actual question which is like how do these rules develop the answer is arbitrarily And like at the base level, there's a lot about language that is just arbitrary Mm -hmm. or evolved because that is the path that it took. But there is a lot of depth uh, and it's a really great question to ask, why do these rules exist in the first place? What is the role that they're playing? Yes. Excellent question, Caitlin. Shall we move on to another question? We shall. All right. Aaron, or possibly Aaron, asks via Instagram. Canadian raising. What actually is it? Uh, It's when you take your Canadian and then you put them on your shoulder and you carry them around and like talk to them. Oh, is it not when you adopt a Canadian child and then you bring them up? That's also true. Maybe it's taking a Canadian child and putting them on your shoulders. Oh. And keeping them there for the whole time they grow up. Oh. That sounds really stressful. (laughs) I carried you on my shoulders for 18 years. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's Canadian Canadian raising is it's the difference between a eh and a eh? <laughs> okay uh but no more seriously Canadian raising is a really interesting phonological process um which has to do with vowels um and it's called Canadian raising because compared to whatever definition of standard US English accent you want to use uh Canadians do this. However, also people in Minnesota do this, and also people all over the North of America do this, and also people in other parts of America do this. They just don't know it. So what you're saying is the Canadians have invaded the U.S., and they're living among us, changing our vowels. Uh, sure. I don't want to promise that it went that direction and that we didn't just steal them. But That like... is the thing that we would do. Honestly, I could see it both ways. Anyway, so. 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 Uh, I'm going to do my best to explain how this works visually. Perfect for a podcast. I know. I Bear with me. And if you get lost, check the show notes or check our fancy Instagram highlight story for episode four. And I will definitely put this chart there. Grizzly bear with you. This what? Canadian. Canadian raising. I'm so confused. You said bear with me. Oh. So I, you know. Oh boy, okay. Uh, I'm going to do my best to explain visually this vowel space and this vowel chart. And if you get lost, uh, check the show notes, check our Instagram story highlight for episode four, and I will put the chart in there as well. Um, So this is a shape that someone, maybe Eli, told me they've heard called the shopping cart of vowels. That sounds like a thing I would say. So, uh... Picture like your typical, at least North American shopping cart, grocery cart, um, and there's like the pretty vertical part next to the handle, and then there's like the slanted part out toward the front. And that is the shape, if you also include like parallel top and bottom lines connecting those two things. Um, That's the shape that we have kind of decided is the vowel space. And it kind of also represents the shape of your mouth where like your throat is the vertical back part 
and your bottom teeth are farther in than your top teeth. And that's how you get that slanty bit at the front. And this is one of the reasons why we like to say that all vowels are the same vowel. Because with consonants, we can be like, yes, there's a really definitive place of articulation. If you make a t sound or a th sound, you're absolutely using your teeth. And if you make a k sound, you're definitely not using your teeth. So those are really distinct. Whereas vowels are all made in your open mouth without touching your tongue to anything. It just kind of matters how open your mouth is and how you put your tongue in your mouth while you make the ah sound. It's kind of like, I've heard it described as like a color map, right? Mm -hmm. When you're like selecting a color on the computer, like you see the entire spectrum and it's like very bright at the top and very desaturated at the bottom. And like red is on one end and purple is on the other. And you like, there are very different greens. Like there's a whole spectrum of greens to pick from. And like, by the time that you are at orange, you are very obviously not in green anymore. But if you had to pick a point where it stopped being green, you couldn't do that. Yes, that's an awesome example. The other thing I was thinking of is like a trombone. Like, yeah, if you just have ever seen someone like hold the trombone closed and play a sound and then just let the slide go out and it's like, and you're like, at what point did any of those notes change? I don't know. So that's like, that's good. Consonants are like, like a trumpet or another like valved brass instrument and vowels uh, are like a trombone. Yes. So as I said previously, uh, English has a ton of sounds, so many sounds. I don't know why English is so selfish with the sounds. Um, I'm sure there's something else we're being really stingy on, but we have so many sounds. And we have some number that I don't remember of individual vowel sounds. And we think it's five casually because we're like, oh yeah, A-E-I-O-U. And then you're like, and sometimes Y. And there's the long and short versions. And sometimes there's an R on them. And, oh, what do I do about ow? That's not a letter. And you're like, ah, crap, we have a lot of vowels. Um, and we do have a lot of vowels and we have things like ow that are what we call diphthongs, which means two sounds that are pronounced as one sound or like you hear them as one sound. So ow is a combination if you say it really slowly, and this is where you're going to start to freak out the people sitting around you. So welcome to the club. Um, bonus points if you're doing this on public transit, although given the timing of everything, cut that part. Anyway, I don't know. I hope some like healthcare workers and other That's essential true. service providers are having their day brightened by listening to us ramble on about weird linguistics things. That's true. And if you are, we love you. Thank you so much. Um, so if you say ow really slow, you're going to get ah, ooh, ow, ow, ow. Um, and that sound ow is your mouth moving from the ah sound, which is like kind of toward the bottom and front of the vowel shopping cart to the oo sound that is much closer to the top and back of the vowel cart. And if you say them really quickly in succession, you get ow, and that's a sound that we recognize in English as being its own independent phoneme. Go ahead. Say it. Say it to yourself now. Wherever you are, just feel your mouth go from the front and the bottom to the top and the back. Okay, keep going. Good job. So then we have another one. We have I, like the things that you see with, or the first person singular pronoun. And that sound starts in the same place as ow starts, actually. But instead of going to oo, it goes to e, which is also toward the top, but toward the front. Again, say it to yourself for a second. I-e. 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 I mean... Pretend that you're Whitney Houston at the beginning of I Will Always Love You. I will always love you. Yeah. Um, I mean, she she actually does this I, I thing. That's true. And actually, that's also why if you are a trained singer, um, you have probably been told not to say ow or not to say I. Because when you hold that sound out for any length of time, you have to pick. You have to either hold on ah or you have to hold on e. You can't hold in that transition space because the whole point of a transition is that it's not stationary. So like my choir teacher always said, if you're going to 
during out the beginning of that song, you got to go, ah, and then at the end, transition to the E. Or then make your transition really long if you want to be dramatic like Whitney Houston. And you um, might be like, can I sit in the middle? And you can't because the middle is A. And nobody wants to be like, and A. Yeah. I mean, I guess <laughs> we are true. talking about Canadian raising. <laughs> but also like, yeah, try that. It's not going to work, but you should prove it to yourself. Give that a try. Extra bonus points if you're singing the song now. Um, anyway. So you have these diphthongs and they are traveling between two vowels in the vowel cart. And the whole point of Canadian raising is that their vowels overall don't start out. Either their diphthongs don't start out as low or some of their single vowels, which are fancily called monophthongs, um, aren't as low as typical American vowels are either. So one of the ways that Americans like to make fun of Canadians, usually in a loving way, uh, is to imitate them and people don't realize that what they're trying to imitate is this Canadian raising but Americans hear Canadians say the word about as in like I'm reading a book about dogs um, as a boot and then you'll be like oh yeah I was ootin' a boot and then Canadians will be like you're gross stop talking don't say that and they'll be like no Americans are all about what do you mean about that's like not a sound and the real issue is that when Canadians say this word, they don't start all the way down at ah. They start um, very close to the middle of the vowel space, probably still a bit toward the front, uh, but much higher. So like in the kind of second out of three tiers, if you will, in the vowel space. So we call it Canadian raising because Americans start down in ah, Canadians start up in uh. And so they'll say, a boat, oat, oat. And to be clear, we're talking about the word about has that ow diphthong in yep. the middle of it. So that's, we're talking about the first of those sounds doesn't start as low. Exactly. And that one in particular is very noticeable to Americans because many Americans don't make the oat sound or the o. They say ow. And so what pisses people off when you start to have this teasing is that because Americans are unused to hearing that sound start higher, they hear it only as the ooh, only as the ending sound. And so they go, oh, Canadians say a boot. And then Canadians are like, no, obviously we don't say a boot. It's a diphthong. There's a second sound in there. You say it wrong. You say out, out. Like you start so low, like what's wrong with you? And of course, Most people don't have the linguistic terminology to actually describe this, so they just yell at each other. Which is also a thing linguists do, so don't worry. But that's the basics of it. The interesting part is that it's not just that diphthong. And it's not just that word. Like I was saying before, people from Minnesota uh, also raise a lot of their vowels. That O, when we make fun of people from Minnesota, is just the same O that we would say, but higher. Ooh, instead of O. Actually, technically O is a diphthong also. It starts at all and goes to ooh. Yeah. And so they start Minnesota. Yeah, they start with a higher version of all. And then that's what we make fun of. Oh, by the way, is uh, about halfway up and in the back. Yes. So if you're trying to figure out, you're, you're saying oh, and you're trying to figure out how to make that a little higher, take the beginning of your O oh and make it just a little more ooh-like. Mm-hmm. But not um, all the way, because that's how you get to Minnesota. Minnesota. Yes. So the other one that is really interesting and that when I learned about Canadian raising in college, I was like, oh, this explains something that I had observed previously as a high schooler, but had no way of explaining. And that was that my friend, usually when she was being really casual, um, but when we separated from each other and headed home after school, she would say bite. And I was like, huh, I say bye. And I couldn't figure out why we were saying it differently. Also, uh, what's the auditory equivalent of eagle-eyed? Sharp-eared. Sharp-eared? Shark-eared? Sharp-eared. Sure. I think. We'll go with that. Shark-eared listeners. No, are... sharp. Sharp with a P. Sharp with a P. Great. Sharp-eared. I like, I like though, that you took the mold of eagle-eyed and you were like, well, it has to be another animal. Well, right? Sharks are known for having good ears. I was like, are they actually? Anyway. Uh, sharp-eared, keen listeners. 
uh, may notice that I have a lot of raised vowels in my speech, and I don't know why. I think it happened when I moved to New England, but like it might be in the outtakes later. I don't know, but I actually messed up saying a boot the first time because I just actually say a boat most of the time, uh, despite never having lived in Canada or Minnesota. And I don't live quite up enough in the Midwest to have raising myself. Yeah. Um, but I got it somewhere and it's really strange. My whole vowel inventory is a mess. Anyway. It's okay. They're all the same vowel. It's true. They are. Um, so my friend was saying bye and I was saying bye. And I was like, I understand that that's the same word, but it's definitely not the same sound. Like, what is she doing? And then... I found out in college, in one of my phonology classes, phonetics, I don't know, in one of those sound classes, that um, the sound I, like I said, is a diphthong. And you can either start it down at ah, like ow, I, or you can start it at uh, like out, and you can say I. And we parse it as the same sound because based on one of the phonotactic rules of English, it is the same sound. What bothers Americans about the way that Canadians use both of these raised sounds is that they don't use the lowered sounds in specific instances where Americans do. Americans raise those sounds in a lot of words, but they don't raise them in about and ride. And Canadians do raise them in those, and that's what bugs people. The I sound typically in American English only shows up when the sound after it is voiceless. So like a K or a T or a P. So we've talked a little bit about minimal pairs, which are two words that are almost exactly the same, except for ideally one single sound. And the fact that that sound separates two words tells you that that's both of those sounds mean something and matter. So in English, you can bite something. You can have a bite of food and you can bide your time. And we spell those almost exactly the same, except for the T and the D. And we hear them as basically rhyming, but they don't. Bite has that raised I and bide has I. And that follows a really reliable pattern. You can write a paper, but ride a bike. Bike is also raised. When there's no consonant after it, we keep it low. So we say bye and fly and try. And what was bothering me about my friend's speech was that she was raising it even though there was nothing afterward to tell her to do that. And I couldn't figure out why. Why? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then I learned and I was like, whoa, that explains everything. That's so cool. And now it's something that I say. I, I will say bye, especially when I'm trying to be like silly or casual because people will understand it. But it's like funny because it's not what you expect. And so my like pet peeve about Canadian raising is that everyone's like, oh, it's a Canadian thing and it's weird. And I'm like, no, it isn't. It's the exact same thing that you do with the word bike. You just don't know. But now you know. That it's it's one phonotactic rule that is different in another dialect. Yes. Um, and actually, as I've said all of that, about ends with a T. So Yes, I was going to point this out. Uh, out. Americans, yeah. Americans, you would think would raise that. But apparently we don't apply the raising rule to the ow sound, but Canadians do. So I would guess that if you're a Canadian listening to this, please uh, tweet at us or something and tell me if I'm right. Um, I would guess that many Canadians would say crowd, like a crowd of people still with ow. And I would guess that they say ow when they get hurt and they don't say, oh, maybe they say that. I don't know. Uh, They probably don't ask, who are you? That sounds like who are you? Almost. Yeah. Well, I guess it would be right between ow and ooh, because that's what Americans think that sound is. Anyway, I'm pretty sure they don't say who are you. I'm pretty sure they say how are you. But when they close it with a T, they apply the raising rule, and most Americans do not. And that's what pisses Americans off. So there you go. I don't think there's anything I can add to that. That's a great answer to the question of what Canadian raising is. I love Canadian raising. Also, if anyone has a small Canadian that wants a ride on my shoulders, I could do that too. (laughs) <laughs> one day we'll have a live show and that can happen it's true all right uh <laughs> shall we uh say, talk about last time's puzzler you, please remind us what our puzzler was absolutely so we have a puzzler every episode and last episode our puzzler was 
what do these words have in common? And the words are assess, banana, dresser, grammar, potato, revive, uneven, and voodoo. Uh, And the answer, which it took me a little bit to get, and then like a light bulb went off in my head, um, is that if you take off the first letter, what's left is a palindrome. It's the same backwards That's awesome and forwards. Because the answer that was given when I found this puzzler was if you add the first letter to the end, it becomes a palindrome. <laughs> which Ooh. is by definition. So you get like yep. bananab yep. or dressered grammar. Potato potatobe. Potato? <laughs> potato. It's a high quality potato. Reviver. That's a real word. One day we'll open a linguistics themed bar and we will serve <laughs> grammars. That's excellent. Uh, I nominate that we call these spalindromes. <laughs> spalindromes. I love it. Do you know about uh, immortal apps? About what? Immortal apps. So uh, an immortal app, spelled the way that palindrome is spelled, but ah, backwards. Okay is a word that when you reverse it becomes a different word. Oh, nifty. So it's not just like a word that isn't a palindrome. It's a word that becomes a different actual word when you reverse it. So like dog and god. Exactly. Yeah. Nice. Those are immortal apps. Nice. Okay. So do we have a new puzzler for this week? We do. So just in case anyone wasn't clear, uh, as a group, we are really big fans of car talk and we are sad that it is off the air, and that at least one of the Tappet brothers has passed away. Uh, But we have really a lot of love for them. And so in addition to kind of stealing their show format, we are also stealing some of their puzzlers because their puzzlers are baller. So uh, this puzzler came from Car Talk, who got it from Bill Denlinger, whoever that is. Thanks, Bill. Uh, And it goes like this. My cousin Bruno put up a bird feeder in his yard. It was nothing fancy, just a flat board with raised edges, kind of like a shallow cigar box with the lid removed so that the food wouldn't fall off. Sarah's insert here. I've never seen a cigar box. I'm imagining this is kind of like a baking sheet with raised edges. Uh, it's got it's got a little bit more height to it, but I mean, think like a shallow shoebox, basically. Um, okay, so like maybe like the lid of a shoebox. Uh, okay, so he has this uh, bird feeder that's kind of like the lid of a shoebox. As Bruno sat in his recliner in the living room, watching the birds come and go, he noticed a peculiar thing. On some days, the birds would all fly into the feeder from the north. On other days, they would fly in from the south. And on some, they seemed to fly in from all directions. The birds weren't tagged, and Bruno didn't know anything about them, but they appeared to be the same birds. He wondered why the birds didn't fly into the feeder from the same direction every day, but had this really peculiar behavior instead. He couldn't explain it until one day he noticed something while he was outside filling up the feeder. And he said, Aha! What did Bruno discover? Ooh, I think I know this. If I think I know this, what should I do, Sarah? You should not say it right now, because we don't want to spoil it. But you should keep okay, it in fair. your head. And then when we announce the answer on the next episode, you can pat yourself on the back if you got it right. Also, hey, this isn't a linguistics puzzler. That's true. Because it turns out that there's not all that many linguistics puzzlers available, and I couldn't think of one. Also, our last ones are not really linguistics puzzlers. They're more like letter puzzles. That's true. However, if you have a cool linguistics puzzler that you want to share, send it to us. We would love to share it, and we can read off your name instead of Bill Dunlinger's name. Although I'm sure Bill Dunlinger is a great person. But also, we just think puzzlers are fun. Uh, Not everything has to be linguistics. It's fine. Um, figure this out. Check back with us next episode to see if you got it right. And obviously you can like Google this. It's out there. It's cheating. Also, totally cheating. we won't find out if you do. So if you get really impatient and want to find out sooner if you got it right, the internet exists. But see if you can figure it out. Because I listen to podcasts while I'm driving. I don't want you guys to like look stuff up on a website while you're driving. Don't do that. It's dangerous. No. Imagine these birds and why they're flying from different directions. Feel free to name them. Yeah, so that's what I got. Uh, That's it for this episode. Thanks so much for listening. Linguistics After Dark is produced by M. Fozzing Enterprises. Audio editing is done by me. Question wrangling is done by Jenny. And show notes are done by Sarah. Transcriptions are a team effort. Our music is Covert Affair by Kevin McClode. Our show is entirely listener supported. You can help us by visiting patreon.com slash mfozzing, which is E-M-F-O-Z-Z-I-N-G. 
and by telling your friends about us. Big shout out today to our patrons because I have a new microphone and Eli's gonna have a new microphone as soon as it gets mailed to him, which is happening at a time in the future. Uh, But this is so cool. I hope that my sound quality is better than it has been and I get to make fun sounds like by accidentally hitting my mic with my fingers. Um, I gotta learn to gesture differently while I talk now. It's a problem. Anyway, you guys are great. And uh, the people who rate us on iTunes and whatever other podcast services have ratings are also really great. And that helps us out so much and gets other people to hear us. So thank you so much. Today, we want to say thanks to these awesome patrons. Bex, Inga, Mitch, Dre, Brighton, Jeff, Rachel, and Dash. We also want to thank... Electric, Caleb1, and Genie2, although Caleb1 has a numeral 1 and Genie2 is T-O-O, tricky there, for leaving us reviews on iTunes. Thank you all so much. Find our episodes and show notes online at linguisticsafterdark.com and on all your favorite podcast directories. And send us your questions, text or audio, to questions at linguisticsafterdark.com or you can tweet them to us at Podcast. Or you can find us on Facebook or Instagram, also at LXAD Podcast. And until next time, if you weren't consciously aware of your tongue in your mouth, now you are. And I was staring at the word loan word and thinking, this is not what happened to that word. You're wrong. <laughs> Well, that's the whole point. <laughs> God damn it. Okay. Whatever I said before was a great lead in. I think you're just going to have to pull it and put it where it now. Oh my God. Actually, I don't even know if lingua franca is a loan word. It might just be using French. Latin. Um, One of the typical ones you always hear is someone saying, oh, a boat. No, shoot. I did it wrong. <laughs> did you Did you do it right? Yes. <laughs> oh, great. My cat has discovered. My recording booth, which is just my bedroom. Hold on. <laughs> cat. I don't... I'm so full of shit today. I don't know what my problem is. No, that was great. I'm totally keeping that in. That was wonderful. Minnesota.